Hello everyone and welcome back to Typical City. The 192nd Manchester Derby is fast approaching this Sunday and Manchester United fans are quaking in their boots. They are terrified. You only need to go and look at the rival channels. All the Man United channels are just brr, nervy, squeak, squeaky bum time in Fergie days. That's what they used to say, wasn't it? Squeaky bum time, mate. Absolutely terrified and with good reason. They have every reason to be fearful of this Manchester City side because we are an unstoppable force. And when we turn it on, we obliterate teams. United have found that out the hard way recently. It's going to be an incredible game. The title chasers versus the top four wannabes. The pretenders. The has-beens. The used-to-bees. They are nobody anymore. They are almost irrelevant to Manchester City fans. To the point where they're getting away with it. I feel like their fans are getting away with murder. Because we used to get so much stick off them. Even when we were in League One then known as Division 2. Even when we were down in the dirt, dogging it around, down there, grimy, grimy days that Manchester City had to suffer with. We still heard it from them. We still had to hear it. Absolutely. And now we don't really give them any stick, to be honest. We don't. And I think they're getting away with murder, in truth. Me, personally, I feel like it's... I just don't care about them anymore. They're not really that... We're so hyped to just be where we are as Manchester City fans. So hyped and so proud. We, like, we just come out with our chests out, proud as anything, that Manchester City are top of the top. The creme de la creme. That's what we are now, and we have overtaken them, surpassed them. They have been superseded by the noisy neighbours. And now that we look down on them, and almost... Uh, there's a, almost a little bit, a little bit of pity, like... Phew, Pathetic, really? Just like crap. The club's just collapsing, quite literally collapsing around them. Now, Blues, I've got a watch long plan for this Sunday, of course. 3.30 kickoff in the UK time. Come and join me for that one. And I've got a very, very special, special surprise for Manchester City fans to come and enjoy. A historic, iconic piece of Manchester City history is going to be here with me live in the typical City studio. Is it a studio? It's a room. It's a spare room in my house, let's be honest. But let's call it the typical City studio because it sounds like a professional. That's exactly what I try to be. Oh, not really. Not really at all. But let's call it professionalism shall we but there is going to be an unbelievable piece of Manchester City history live with me as a surprise a treat for those Manchester City fans it's oh, it's good it's special a very special special piece of Manchester City history and I'm honoured I'm absolutely honoured to have it here with me uh, so come and join me for the watch long 3.30 kickoff in the UK that will be and it's uh, unbelievable unbelievable game that we've got ahead of us. Manchester United could be 11 points off their top four hopeful spot that they're going for because that's the standards now. They're clawing away at the likes of Spurs and Villa, hoping, praying that they can get a top four position. While that would be a disastrous season for us, you know, if we were in that position, even in Spurs or Villa's position where we're scraping around for fourth, that would be a disastrous season. Disastrous for us. It's, the, the standards have changed. The tidal ways, it's, it's changed. Everything in Manchester has been flipped on its head. And I love it. Absolutely love it. And it's karma. It's everything Manchester City fans deserve. Everything. It's going to be a huge game. Manchester City, 18 games unbeaten as well. 18 games. The two that we drew in those 18 games, by the way, because we won 16 of those 18. The two that we did draw, though, were at the Etihad. And those old cliches of, oh, it's a derby. You never know. You just never know. Man United could turn up. Who knows? They always ring true. And it's so cliche and almost boring. How many times have we said that? But it never stops being true. That's the frustrating thing with a Manchester derby. This just something could happen. Something wild could happen. We saw it last season with that ridiculous Marcus Rashford offside goal. Absolutely outrageous decision. They should be hanging their heads in shame. I'd be ashamed to get three points in such a despicable manner like that. Disgraceful. You know, it could happen. A refereeing decision. I just want it to be a fair game. No refereeing decisions. No VAR decisions. Just Manchester City versus Manchester United. Our 11 versus your 11. And you know what? If it comes down to that, we're going to wipe the fucking floor with them. We're going to take them to the cleaners. Obliterate them. Demolish them. And I mean... Do we want to look at the goal difference? Personally, I think we probably could in this game. On paper, we certainly should because their back four is riddled with injuries. It's a, a very open-ended back four that I think can be exposed with ease if you play your cards right. They've got injuries all over the park, whereas Manchester City have got almost a full bill of health to choose from. But uh, Manchester United, they've got an OK record prior to losing to Fulham. That Fulham game, which was just kind of out of the blue, they had won six out of six away games in 2024. So they were doing OK 
okay before Fulham. And, of course, they got the last minute. They scraped a win against Forrest with that Casemiro header in the 92nd, 93rd minute. I can't remember exactly where he cut his head open. Um, but it's unbelievable. Manchester City are chasing a record as well. To score a goal at the Etihad would be our would equal our record that was achieved from 2012 to 2014, where we scored in 55 home matches in a row. If we do that against Manchester United, we equal that record. I mean, come on, we can go and break that record. I mean, the records that we break, we only seem to break our own records anymore because all the records we've smashed everyone else's and no one else can get near these records that we're setting anywhere, anymore. We're the only ones that can break them. So we're breaking our own records. We're our own worst enemy. We, the standards we set are our own. Do you know what I mean? Everyone else is clawing away, trying to be something, emulate Manchester City in some way. Even United, just please, can we be a little bit like City? Please. We even heard uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe trying to say like he brought Manchester City up in his opening statement with the takeover at Manchester City came up and how well Pep Guardiola's doing. The signing of Omar Barada is now being lauded as one of the greatest signings in history, even though he's a fucking CEO, you know, talking about transfer targets. Is that, that, that the future? Is that the future? We're talking about play business individuals, you know, people under the, the under, behind the scenes, not in the starting eleven anymore. We're not interested in football players. We're talking about Omar Barada as a massive coup for them. That's their, you know, just copying Manchester City. And you're always going to be one step behind. If you're trying to emulate a club, you're always going to be one step behind because you're following in the footsteps of a genius. And that is Pep Guardiola. You can't emulate Pep Guardiola. He is the top man in management in the world of football. The greatest manager the world has ever seen as a manager. Incredible things that he has done. Um, but United, in terms of form as well, conceded 10 in their last two away games against Manchester City, which is just all fun and games, isn't it? Going up against Manchester United, especially at the Etihad lately. It's been a lot of goals, a lot of goals. So I'm hoping for a high scoring game with plenty in one end and not so many in the other would be ideal. A clean sheet would be nice as well. A clean sheet would be nice. Haaland, of course, scored five goals in the last game, which is a big factor into why Manchester United fans are cacking themselves. They're absolutely quaking in their boots, shitting their pants. They don't know what to what to expect from this game with Kevin De Bruyne's four assists, Haaland's five goals. The timing of those two players just into place, just clicking into place, just oh, the cogs start turning, don't they? And the cogs in their little brains, those little United fans' brains, they start to turn as well. They start to go, oh shit, oh shit, what are we going up against? What are we going up against? But you just never know. That's the problem with the Manchester derby. It always is. Such little details can turn the tide completely and swing everything on its head with the likes of Marcus Rashford, who you just know the narrative is built for him to score a goal. It is set up for him to score a goal with the likes of... His record is awful right now. Absolutely awful. No goals in five games, but he always seems to pop up when he's under scrutiny. That's the deal with Marcus Rashford. Right now, I do feel like he's better coming from the left. Will he play in the middle? I'll get onto my team news in a minute. But the issue for me is the fact that he's not scored in five games. He's under scrutiny right now. People questioning his body language, but it's like he, he popped up the last time that happened and he scored a goal. I think it was Wolves, if memory serves me. And he might do it again. And he's a dangerous player on his day. You know when he wants to play, he's dangerous. That's half the problem, though. United sign these players or, or bring these players through now. Well, the, the whole club tends to have a, a model where it's like, do you feel like turning up today? The whole model of Manchester United seems like, let's see how it goes. If you feel like working hard today or do you not feel like working hard today? Paul Pogba, by the way, who's in the news for the wrong reasons right now. He's the prime example of Manchester United. He encapsulates Manchester United perfectly as far as I'm concerned. And he can pop a cherry on the cake with the fact that he's been banned for four years as well. That kind of sums up Manchester United for me, completely, in a nutshell. Team news, though. City have got Grealish and Gavardiol to worry about, which is a shame because I would have liked to have seen Grealish uh, playing in this game. It's ideal, really ideal game for Grealish, but Doku hopefully can do the business. Gavardiol is out as well. That's, that's it. That's it for City. So we're blessed with a few only injuries to worry about, which isn't too bad. Manchester United team news, not, not the case. They've got a fair few to worry about in fairness with Hoyland, Maguire, Malassia, Shaw, Aaron Wambasaka, Martinez, Martial, all out. Bruno Fernandes limped off against Forrest as well, but he is deemed to be okay, which is, I mean, I'm wondering whether, I doubt Manchester City are ever going to make something as funny as the Fulham videos did. Their social media team at Fulham humiliating Manchester United, humiliating Bruno Fernandes, and just highlighting in quite an immature way, in fairness to United. I do understand why United are a bit pissed off. 
about that, but I couldn't care less. That's hilarious as far as I'm concerned. As a fan, I enjoy seeing that. A club humiliating and mocking another football club is kind of like... You'll never see City do that because we're a class above that. I do feel like Manchester City Football Club are a class above that. We win on the pitch and we leave it there. We leave it on the pitch and we just remind you of the score lines. That's all we ever need to do. Remind you of the score lines. You know, whereas Fulham just humiliated and highlighted to the world what a clown, what an actor, what a diving little rat-faced cheat Bruno Fernandes actually is on that football pitch. He's one of the worst attitudes I've ever seen and he's their leader. That's their captain. People at City, we've been arguing about Kyle Walker being a leader. What he does off the pitch is not ideal in terms of leadership, but in terms of on the pitch, I think Kyle Walker leads by example. You would never see him diving around like that and just like whinging at his own players and complaining at every opportunity. He's just a wind cheat. That's all Bruno Fernandes is. That's all he ever has been. And on his day, he can also turn up and be a genuine threat. But he can also go missing. Completely missing. And that's their leader. Another player that kind of encapsulates Manchester United for me. But... Um, predicted starting 11s, I think they've got a more difficult job than Manchester City fans, or Manchester City in general have, in Pep Guardiola versus Eric Ten Hag. There's only one bald fraud in Manchester, and it ain't Pep Guardiola. But let's have a quick look at the predicted starting 11s, my predicted starting 11s. Starting with Manchester City, I'm going to go with Edison in goal. And I do feel like there's only one position for Manchester City to genuinely concern about, and that's that right side of centre-back. I think that's the only area that's up for debate, really. I might be wrong. You might have your own opinions. Get in the comments and drop a like on the video as well if you're uh, if you're watching at this point as well as subscribe if you're new. And let me know what your predicted starting eleven is as well. I'd love to hear it. But I'm going to go with Kyle Walker, which I think a lot of people will disagree with. I think some people prefer Manuel Akanji. I'm torn. It is just the fact that United have speed. They have speed on the counter-attacks, and that's that's the issue for me. That's the issue against Manchester United. Ruben Diaz at centre-back and Nathan Ake at left-sided centre-back. And I think the rest starts to pick itself from this point out. I'm going to see John Stones in the middle of the park alongside Rodrigo. And then in front of them, KDB of course, who has just hit the ground running. Finally, like, you know, we're seeing that link-up play between Kevin De Bruyne and Erling Haaland. I felt like Erling Haaland was scoring on his day. He did get that link-up play for the second goal at, against Ever uh, Everton, it was, yeah, at the Etihad, where it was a lovely through ball and uh, Branthwaite was put on his arse by Erling Haaland. But other than that, we never really saw the connection between Kevin De Bruyne and Erling Haaland. And City fans have been craving that so much, just craving that connection between Erling Haaland and Kevin De Bruyne and they absolutely delivered against Luton. Perfect timing as well. Will we see that same connection? That same connection we saw in the 6-3 where Kevin De Bruyne whips that ball in between Varane and I think it was Martinez to the back post and Daddy Long led Stretch Armstrong, whatever you want to call him, go-go gadget legs, Erling Haaland, Bedoying stretches his leg out, back post finish. What a goal that was. Absolutely loved that goal. Alongside Kevin De Bruyne, I'm going to go with Stockport Iniesta, Felipe Foden. And then on the right, I'm going to go with Bernardo Silva. On the left, I'm going to go with Jeremy Doku. And up top, the big man, Erling Haaland. Now, the United team is where it starts to get a little bit uh, messy. A little bit messy. They are short on numbers, which is another factor of why Manchester United fans are terrified of this game. Andre Onana's not injured, though, so he'll likely be starting the game. What they do at left-back, because Amrabat played against Forrest in the FA Cup at left-back, which was an interesting choice. I personally am not sure they should do that, to be honest. I think they should have natural defenders. If I was United, I would be playing the best four defenders that they have at their disposal as out-and-out -out defenders, to players that are known for defending. Amrabat's a, a defensive-minded player, but he's a midfielder by trade. I feel like they need four defenders to play against this Manchester City side because it is going to be a disgustingly low block. It's going to be a grim watch where they just absorb pressure, hang on, batten down the hatches, hope for the best and maybe pray for something on the counter-attack or a set piece or a refereeing decision. That's the scraps that Manchester United are living off in this Manchester derby. Lindelof at left-back. Going to go with Varane at right centre-back. And I am going to go with... Um, Mr. Evans at centre-back. There he is. Couldn't find him. Hiding away there. The man who got sent off, of course, to open the floodgates for the 6-1 thrashing at Old Trafford. Johnny Evans, welcome back, mate. Good to see you still wearing a United shirt, mate, in your old age. Right back, Diogo Dallo. It's going to be really interesting to see how he handles, who has been one of the bright 
players, you know, at the, in United squad this season. He has been one of the better performers going up against Jeremy Doku. Though Jeremy Doku is a weak spot in our team right now. I actually feel like I don't feel like he's a player playing badly. I just don't feel like he's hitting the heights Jeremy Doku was at the start of the season. I feel like he's got to find his feet again. I felt like that injury that he had that wasn't that long. That Doku struggled since then. He's not really getting many assists. He's not really beating his fullback as often. He's getting no goals. I'd like to see end product from Jeremy Doku in this game and how they focus on Jeremy Doku. But the fact is, Doku's someone to think about. Whether he's in form or out of form, you can't take your eyes off him. He's a magical, scintillating entertainer. And that's, from a fan perspective, from a Manchester United perspective, they know he's a threat. You can't ignore a player like Jeremy Doku just because he's out of a bit of form right now. So he's a, he's a thorn in the side that I want to be constantly present in this game. And if he plays his cards right, we can just see something a little bit extra special. That little level of composure that we need for, to see from Jeremy Doku. He can turn the tide. He can pick a lock. He can. He doesn't pick a lock. Sorry, wrong terminology. He can smash a door open. He can kick that door open, waving the 4-4, as Biggie Smalls once said. We can absolutely see something like that from Jeremy Doku. Love to see that. Uh, in front of them, I think you're going to see Casemiro, which is someone who I think we can be... Pressing, pressing, threatening him. Let's get him on a yellow card nice and early. Get him on a yellow card nice and early and that guy is just a walking disaster. A, a red card walking dead man. He's someone who will just like go in, rash and get himself sent off, do something stupid. I feel like he's a great player when he's when he's ticking, he's, he's brilliant and yeah, I think he's a very good defensive midfielder but you know, he's just dangerous in terms of to his own team at times with the amount of times he could get uh, himself sent off. So put him under pressure, that would be nice. Um, Kobe Mainu, who is probably a, a, another bright spark in Manchester United season, he's been doing really well for them this season. City have been linked with him a couple of months ago as well. We were linked with him. I can't see that happening, to be honest. Now I can't see that happening, not with the new takeover happening, not a chance of that. But the fact that we were linked with him before he was even getting in to Manchester United starting 11 shows that he must be a good player. There is a talented young lad there, someone to be careful of. He can score goals, he's a box to box type of player. It worries me, him in the midfield. He's a good player. Uh, in front of them, the whinging rat face. Where is he? You know who I'm talking about. I don't even need to put him on there. I could just say that, couldn't I? Leave it there, leave it there. The whinging rat face. You all know. Do you know what I mean? I don't need to say his name. You know who I meant. <laughs> it's Bruno Fernandes. Shock horror. Bruno Fernandes in front of them. I've seen a, a couple of suggestions that might play him on the right, which would be interesting to see if Bruno Fernandes could play on the right because they don't trust Anthony. Now, I'm hoping they do trust Anthony. Anthony, by the way, who scored that wonder goal in the 6-3 last, last season to make it, what was it, 6-1? Uh, I think it was 6-1 or was it 4-1? I can't remember when he scored, actually. He might have been made it 3-1, actually. If I can't remember exactly when he scored, but it was a really good goal other than that completely anonymous but you know Anthony can do those things but for 85 million pounds what a flop he's been since then really and that was him starting his Manchester United career and when he scored that goal you're thinking okay they've signed a decent player there anonymous since then irrelevant irrelevant player I kind of hope they do start him for for the the reasons I've just gone into there so I'm going to put him on the right and on the left is Garnacho, who isn't the quickest player in the world, but he's a box of tricks. He's not slow, but he's a box of tricks. Someone to be really careful of. And with no Rasmus Hoyland, it's going to be Marcus Rashford. I'm hoping through the middle because I do think Marcus Rashford is more of a threat coming in from the left. He's a more dangerous player on the, on the wings coming in from that left-hand side which could be posing an even bigger threat for Kyle Walker. Now, in practice, I think we're going to see something along the lines of this. Now, what I want City to do is maintain their width. Because of the threat that United have on the counter-attack, I want us to maintain our width from players who are naturally better at doing that job. Jeremy Doku and Bernardo Silva, Erling Haaland up top, Kevin De Bruyne in these pockets with Phil Foden in the, the opposite pockets, John Stones and Rodri tucking in to prop up behind De Bruyne and Phil Foden, which I think can work it has worked really well for a couple of years now, let's be honest. I don't want to see Nathan Ake getting forward or Kyle Walker getting forward. I feel like these guys should just be propping up on the halfway line, just keeping us, maintaining our attacks, you know, keeping us in these positions. Now, the idea of maintaining Bernardo Silva's width and Jeremy Doku's width is pick your poison, Diogo Dallo and Victor Lindelof. What do you want to do? Do you want to keep that back four nice and tight? Because I tell you what, Johnny Evans and Varane, they're going to be double teaming Erling Haaland. They're going to be close as ever to, these, to, to the likes of Erling Haaland in the middle. So do you want Lindelof to come out, force them out? 
And look at that there. You can pop into those gaps, get Kevin De Bruyne into those gaps. That's going to drag Kane, um, Casemiro and Maynou back into positions. And before you know it, it's attack versus defence. Men against boys and United hanging on for dear life. If we do that, we have more of a chance. If, we cut, if they don't pose that threat, and they maintain their shape, keep it narrow, force City wide, then it is up to Bernardo Silva and Jeremy Doku to perform, to get good deliveries into the box, work those triangles, try and lure them out of positions as often as possible. That's the issue. Will Garnacho be tracking back? That's another area of the pitch that if, if Bernardo Silva maintains his width, Garnacho probably has more of a, a thinking job to do, whereas Kyle Walker will make his mind up for him. But if Kyle Walker gets forward, he's got the thinking job to do with Kyle Walker because he will have to get back should City lose the ball. And I don't want to see Anthony, Marcus Rashford and Fernandez and Garnacho sprinting on our goal with only Nathan Ake and Ruben Diaz as two fixed defenders to hold the back line for Manchester City. With Kyle Walker there, I feel like the speed can nullify and mop up any sort of loose balls. Counter-attacking opportunities for Manchester United can be kept quiet and to a minimum and if we do that we kill their threat that's their threat that's their game other than set pieces and refereeing decisions counter-attacking football is their only other threat and if we kill that off they are incredibly limited Manchester United incredibly limited whereas we have an arsenal of weapons at our disposal to pick locks break down doors wonderful goals intricate football whatever it may be we don't need refereeing decisions we don't need set pieces and we're dangerous from them as well let's not forget we are dangerous from set pieces when we play them right but at the end of the day, we have way more at our disposal from an attacking sense. And we should, should be wiping the floor with this United time. But like I said, like I said, it's a Manchester derby. You just never know. But Blues, get your predictions in the comments below. I really want to hear your thoughts. Come and join me for the watch along. Come and find out what that iconic piece of Manchester City's history is. It's going to be here, sat with me for the watch along. Come and join me. It's going to be a good one. Get in the comments below. I want to hear your thoughts. Like and subscribe. Typical City of the channel. And I'll see you in the next one. This is typical. 